I'm here with Stuart, obviously, from Get Pro Copy. We're here in, in Manchester in your remote workspace. What would you call this? Yeah, this is, this is a, the colony in Manchester. Uh, I've used it as a meeting room. I've got my own office at home, hmm. uh, but I, I do use this uh, as a place to meet clients. But you've also brought along Cassie with you, who's your rescue dog. How long have you had Cassie for now? I've had her for about six years. Uh, got, again, it, it coincided with the, almost the start of the business. Yeah. So it, there's, a, there's a nice synergy between the business uh, doing well and me getting a dog. Yeah, has she got an orange collar as well? Yes, she has. <laughs> I didn't know it's no, I was just guessing. Yes, just yes, assuming yes, based yes. everything else. Let's kick it off by talking a bit about your education, where you studied and, and sort of what your specialisms were or what you really enjoyed at school. Well, from, from about the age of four, I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I'd, I'd got this uh, thing at primary school of writing poems, uh, quite mawkish, sentimental poems. Uh, but I, I've got this, uh, I've got this skill with words that I had from childhood because I, w- I was an undiagnosed celiac. So instead of going out and playing like other kids my age did, I used to sit in the house reading and uh, writing. And uh, quite an odd child, uh, but uh, you know, at primary school, I was seen as uh, uh, something of a, a prodigy because I had this way with uh, communication and words. And so what happened with me is I, I, I did well at English at uh, A level. I got an A. I then moved to, and I was really good in the class. Then I moved, uh, then I went to do a degree to keep it real in Sunderland, and I got a two-one degree in English. And the logical step was, uh, you know, the writer thing didn't exist as a career then, apart from journalism. And I thought the logical thing was to go and teach English. Uh, but uh, you know, since about 2015, I've not touched education as a thing. And yet, the English that I practiced at four years old, when I was writing these silly poems about loving my mum and about cars and motorways. Motorways were a new thing then in '69. Uh, the, the, this, these skills, the skill set I picked up has been very useful and it's been very lucrative. Because uh, I was talking to a friend the other day, and she was saying, you know, when you think about it, Stuart, we we're, we're, uh, were us as English teachers, we were, were some of the best in class from an early age, and I was, and I'm sure she was because she's an excellent teacher, Gillian, and uh, we we picked up we picked up that ability. And that talent to be recognised, uh, you know, is some of the best in that niche, and it served me well. What What did you enjoy most about English? And what was there any literature pieces that really sort of inspired you? Or yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you had it when you were at school, but I used to, I used to love those uh, big books that you'd see on shelves. So okay. you know, when you see those giant books that are like two foot tall, yeah, they, they now make poster art. Yeah, you know, yeah, you'd yeah. put them in a frame, uh, and I used to love getting those little newsletters where you could buy a book. Where you'd, you'd you'd get these like little magazine yeah. with books for sale in it, and it, it, it was pre-internet, so you know, and W. H. Smith were the only bookseller in town. Yeah. So to get that and take it home, and your mum and dad uh, say, "Yeah, we'll pay twenty p uh, for that book," was really exciting. But I, I used to love I used to love reading uh, poems. Yeah. Uh, that that was a main literary source, you know, uh, and and then at eleven, I graduated to uh, Dickens and Jane Austen. It was a bit bit strange looking back. <laughs> You know, there's no Harry Potter in those days, but my, children, my choice of literature was uh, Jane Austen, and then I graduated George Orwell. So I was quite precocious as a reader. Yeah. Uh, and, and what uh, sort of age would you have been when reading those? 11, 12. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's quite an young. An advanced reader then. Yeah, 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 I was an advanced reader. And yet the irony is now, I don't read. And it's partly because I'm of an iPad generation and my eyes are failing at 57. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I pick up a book, I start pinching and zooming. Do you think it's not as stimulating compared to sort of digital world now? Do you think with a book? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it is, but I, I think physically it's like when I pick, I like reading the newspaper, so I'll, I'll, I'll read The Guardian on an app. Yeah. You know, but I would never go in a shop and buy The Guardian because I find it difficult to read the text. And someone said, well, get reading glasses, but yeah, I have glasses to drive with, but I, yeah. I, don't, I don't particularly enjoy reading anymore. And I think having 27 years of reading to classes, you know, reading The Mice and Men, reading The Crucible. Yeah, it's almost uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say destroyed, but it, it, it's nullified any uh, any interest in reading for pleasure because it was my job. Yeah, do you not think that reading and stuff then may inspire some of your copywriting or inspire the way that you write or anything like that? Yeah, it does because they say that if you want if you want you know James Altucher, uh, an influencer, says if you want to be a good writer, you've got to be a good reader, and I'm conscious that this is something missing me from my armory. So if I go and see something and I wander around Manchester and I'm always documenting things on video 
and photographs, I, I do find that it inspires me. So I went to Old Trafford uh, to watch Man United versus Everton in the FA Cup third round. Radford, Rashford got a, a, a penalty awarded. I recorded it like, you know, all fans do. Uh, put it on TikTok, got 22,000 views. And I've started a blog on the experience of gold, going to Old Trafford. Uh, so, you know, I didn't read about Rashford. I know he's from Withenshaw. I know he's taken on the government uh, about free school meals and won. Uh, but the fact that I saw him score a penalty, I recorded it, and then I've done some research on him, it, it's inspired me to write a blog about going to Old Trafford. And I went to the Etihad the other day, Yeah. and I'm going to talk about the contrast between the two stadiums. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, it's not me picking up Jane Austen or uh, uh, Thomas Hardy and thinking, oh, I'll read that novel. It, it's picking up something that is a lived experience, if that doesn't sound too uh, odd. So what do you think was the main sort of approach you took to be able to get students in, engaged with English then? Well, I, I think I think like anything, you've got to make it fun, you know. So uh, kids used to say to me, oh, is it Film Friday? I used to show a lot of films and I, I had this golden rule that you, you couldn't teach a book. I couldn't teach lit literature unless there was a, a film to it. So, you know, and I took it to extreme. So Holes came out, the novel, and I, I took them to see it at the cinema in Scunthorpe. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. I still remember that. Romeo and Juliet, Baz Luhrmann. That's a great film, yeah. When I took when I was in Stoke on Trent and we we're doing that for set text, I took the all the all the year group, yeah. eighty kid eighty kids, uh, to the Odeon in Stoke to see it. You know, and I had this rule that and, and they'd say, Oh, can we read this book? Plus I'd see the stock room. And I'd say there's no film. <laughs> <laughs> I always taught them yeah. the book first, but I did like that dynamic between reading and then visual. And it's, it's probably transferred itself to how I write. You yeah. know, I, I do like seeing something. And it inspires me, but I do, I do think, I do think uh, lessons have to be fun. And it, but I did run uh, risks with city management in that I, I was a bit of a maverick in that I'd say no. So people would say to me, you know, well, you've got to follow that lesson plan, and I'd say I don't like it. I'm not doing it. I'd prefer being daft in front of a class and being the centre of attention. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I had control of the class without without being a, a strict. Yeah. Uh, there was this mutual respect, and kids used to say to me, "It's like being taught by my best mate." And I can I can walk in any classroom. I could do it now at fifty seven, and and you know as a supply teacher, they wouldn't mess around. Yeah. So I've just got sounds really big headed, but I've just got something about me that uh, I'm not a lion tamer. Yeah. I'm not a class clown, but I'm, I've got. So I'm, I am a bit of a pied piper with kids. Yeah, I think you come across very honest as well. So yeah. it's, there's none of that sort of, you know, everything you say you feel like it's very truthful and has purpose. Yeah. So you know it makes a lot of sense, and obviously yeah. But I think you're right. Having respect is the main thing that will keep a student engaged, I guess. And it works not just for students, but it works with anyone as well. I think. Yeah, so. but I do think in teaching, I had a shelf life, and I do remember uh, your school. I do remember thinking, I have had enough of this. You know, I have, I have, I've literally twenty seven years of teaching English. It's quite a marathon, but I had a lot of fun there, and. Uh, so it's not been time badly spent at all. Yeah. It's been time well spent, and I do like to think I've left a legacy. What was it that made you decide to, to leave teaching then in the end and start pursuing your, your own goals? Did you have a, a, a plan in place before you left, or did you just need to get out and finish teaching? No, uh, as I said earlier, I, I was a buckaroo off the teaching saddle, uh, and it, I didn't want to leave teaching, but I knew my shelf life was up. So there's this dichotomy between knowing that you've got to leave and then not having the guts to do it. And it was, the decision was made for me. I'm effectively blacklisted from teaching uh, for uh, taking a head on. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, but there's no there's no secret about it. I've written about it. So, you know, don't don't be shocked by this <laughs> revelation. If you go on my website, you'll find all sorts of references to it. Uh, but I, I moved to Norfolk thinking I'll retire. Um, this was at 37, but I, I didn't expect to retire so soon. Uh, but then the reality of toxic schools uh, reared their heads. And uh, I, at the end of my teaching career, I was banging on the door trying to let back in. And I suddenly realised, metaphorically, there was a door next to me with a, a beautiful light shining <laughs> through, saying, come in, come in. And it was freelance. Yeah. And that, that road was freelance. So I set up the business, getprocopy.com, in uh, November 2015. It was about when I was actually teaching, when I was suspended from teaching. And uh, I thought, well, what can I do well? And the answer came back, writing. 
So let's talk a little bit about setting up freelance then. Obviously, you decided to, to do that and it's completely changed your life around. Oh, it's right, say. Yeah. 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 So I decided that I was going to find something that had low outgoings. Uh, so it didn't cost me anything to set up a business. I didn't have to buy stock. I didn't have to find a shop, a retail premises or anything like that. I didn't have to employ staff. That only would need a workspace, a little desk and a, a computer. Yeah. And that, that business was copywriting. So that's what I got into that. I went down to a, a place in Yarmouth that the second hand desks and I, I paid uh, £10 uh, for a, de- a folding desk that, that looked like it'd come out for school, ironically, like one of these exam desks. Yeah, yeah. It almost had the ink well in it. <laughs> and then the uh, uh, Fiverr for a, a, a little fuzzy chair, blue fuzzy chair with like itchy, scratchy fabric like a bus. And I, I put those together in this small bedroom and uh, thought it was a bee's knees, put a laptop on there. And thought, right, I'm setting up my own business. And I've gone from like this really rudimentary £15 setup to having a standing desk and a Herman Miller chair, you know, because my branding has become on point. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And uh, my business has expanded, obviously. It's it's been a great success because it's gone from copywriting to web design, to social media management, to almost, I hate to use the word, but I've got got a bit of a, a good following. I wouldn't say influencer. Yeah, yeah. But the, 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 I've got massive social media presence because I'm a show off. Well, the thing that I'm most interested in because uh, there is this massive library of information now online for, for loads of stuff. I mean, I taught myself numerous different things while I was studying at uni and stuff, just for YouTube videos, chatting to people on forums and stuff like that. And you learn your new career from scratch basically online. Obviously, other than the writing, you had experience and skill and obviously, you know, really high skill level when it comes to copywriting and, and creatively writing. But yeah, what was it like then to have to teach yourself something completely online and go and looking for the resources? Because it can be difficult. Um, and definitely if you don't know what it is, you don't know what to look for. Well, it, it, it was quite easy for me because I've always been that type anyway. So if, if, I, if I went to school, and I did move schools a lot, uh, if I went to school and they said, oh, Heroes is on the curriculum, Robert Corby, and, I, you know, Google was around 10 years ago. I'd Google and I'd find lesson plans for it and I'd read about it. So I could pick up uh, ways of teaching new literature that I wasn't familiar with, you know, because it wasn't in my sub men from 87 to 2015. <laughs> yeah. I did teach other things. Uh, so... I've always been quite uh, innovative in in researching things. Uh, How I got into web design is people would say to me, can you write a blog for me, a blog post? And I'd say, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to put it straight on your website? And I'd say, oh, yeah, please. So they'd give me admin access to the WordPress website. I'd click plus new post, add the the text from a Word document, put the featured image in. And then I'd have a poke round because it was time rich. And I'd say um, say to myself, "This, this doesn't look that difficult to set up a website. And then, you know, because I'm curious, I'm naturally curious, I started watching YouTube videos and reading about how, how to set up WordPress. I compare web design to put, putting a jigsaw together, but some people can't see the front of the jigsaw, they can't see the cover, they can't mm. see the box, they can't interpret the edges, what to put in first. But I, I'm, I'm very good at putting jigsaws together uh, in my own life. Yeah. You know, I'm very organised and I'm very focused and I'm, I'm very organised in my business life. Do you think that that kind of organisation and that sort of thing comes from having a very regimented job or a, a well structured career? I, I just think it, I, I think it's part of my. I, I'm, I'm from a very working class family, and uh, my mum and dad both worked hard to make ends meet. You know, when I was growing up, so I saw that I had role models of hard working people, and my parents are very organised as well. You know, they, they, they've got this uh, methodical approach to things that I've picked up on. So you you do keep up with technology quite rapidly and you're very, very open to a changing world. Um, do you find that other people around the same age as you or around the same industry, you share the same kind of openness to changing technology? Yeah, I, I think I think the thing is, I, I, am, I am a bit of an Apple sheep. <laughs> I, I do have everything Apple and I have tried to move away, but it always pulls me back in. Yeah. And I don't think Apple's particularly technologically advanced. I think the software and hardware is good, but it is it's one of these three to ninety nine. It's a Lego mentality where you can you can pick up an iPhone when you're three or an iPad when you're ninety nine and you can work out 
the, just the interface random. mainly. Is the the interface, attraction. yeah, it's yeah. very easy. So I, I don't pretend to be, you know, I don't pretend to be like, oh, I love Android. I love the customizable nature of a yeah. home screen. I do stick with what I know. Uh, but I I am, you know, I'm, I'm 57. I'm on TikTok. You mentioned Be Real to me last night. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm always open. I, I was never on that clubhouse thing. Uh, I didn't like the idea of that, listening to influencers. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm not into that. And I'm not, you know, when during COVID, when everyone was having these screenshots of uh, massive Zoom meetings, I thought, oh, I can't imagine anything worse. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I don't like meeting for meeting's sake. But I do appreciate that Zoom and Teams has changed the way we meet. Yeah. And I do think remote working has made my business uh, more acceptable. You know, people don't say to me, oh, can you come into work? Can you meet me at such and such? Uh, it's now an accepted way because of COVID. Uh, but uh, the technology, yeah, technology has changed everything. Yeah. Well, you know, I look at Next, who've just bought Made.com and they paid three. Oh, have they? Yeah, they bought, paid, paid three million for a shop, a shop that doesn't exist. Because yeah. they want the domain name. Yeah, there is one in London, actually. I've seen is it. it. Yeah, uh, near Tottenham Court Road. Oh, right. Uh, I've okay. seen it. But obviously, Next has... Is Next Habitat, I think, they have? Or no, they just have Sainsbury's Next Home. Right. Sainsbury's is Habitat. That's yeah, it. yeah. Like yeah Next Home, Argos. isn't it? Yeah. We look at Argos. So they're, they're a good business model. Uh, little chewy pen or pencil. You'd go in, you'd market and think. And they were under threat. So they, they slimmed down the stores, linked up with Argos, linked up with eBay for click and collect. And they've created a new business model that's hybrid, yeah. and they've survived as a result. Yeah. And the prices match Amazon if you ever go in there. Eight years freelance in Norfolk. How did you, or how big did your network become? Obviously, you've said that you've spread out outside of Norwich. You know, how big did the network become before you started doing that? So you start off with this little core uh, of the clients, and it gradually spreads out. And I did quite a bit of outbound work because I had a bit of a neck on me uh, early days where I'd send cold emails and I'd actually pick up the phone uh, to estate agents and say, can, can I help you with your... You've got a blog post, but your last blog post... You've got a blog page, but your last blog post was uh, 2012. Do you want me to write for you? I'll do them for uh, £20 each. I went to physical networking events. So in Norfolk, I went to 4N and I met people there. And it's just it's just about putting it, I think it's about putting yourself out online and in person. And I think the key to making a success of business, just as it was with teaching, is helping. I think if you give, you shall receive. Not in a biblical sense, you know, I'm not, <laughs> not trying to turn like Jesus and I walk on water and braid and water. You have it. Uh, but I, I, I do think there's this law of reciprocity, I can't even say it, uh, where... If you, if you give something, someone will reciprocate. Nine yeah. times out of ten, if you help someone, it comes back to get you. It's just as if you're nasty with people, it will bite you on the arse. Yeah. The karma train. So, yes, yeah, so you've obviously built up a lot of strong connections doing that then. Obviously got a good key to networking and it's obviously obviously works well. Um, what's, what would you say is the sort of the big or the most important thing to building that, a strong connection that leads to work? I, th I think you've got to find your own tribe. I think you've got to find people who are like you. Uh, politically, and people disagree with this. I think, you know, yeah, I go on LinkedIn and I'm very political on LinkedIn about not liking the Tory party, uh, quite left wing, which most teachers are. Uh, I'm anti Brexit, but instead of, instead of trying to work with people who are not aligned with your values, I think you've got to find your tribe because you can work better where your values chime with someone else's values mm. that are the same. So, for example, tomorrow night, I took the phone call uh, last night. I'm going out on a birthday do with someone who's a, a big anti-Brexiter. And I'll, I've worked with him professionally. I've done a website for him, Ron. So I've worked with him, but it, our, our values also coincide. So I think yeah. the key to networking is not trying to be everything to everyone, but trying to be something to people who are like you. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's good. It doesn't necessarily you don't necessarily think it has to be a, a political sort of alliance, but just something, an interest of sorts, then that yeah, you have to yeah. share or something in common. And if I if I think someone is you know, for example, that, that Andrew Tate, not that he'd ever come to me anyway, but <laughs> I would never yeah. work with Andrew Tate. Yeah, I would never work with Jeremy Clarkson. Jeremy Clarkson, not that he would anyway. He said to me, you know, can you write me a blog post, Stuart? when he's a brilliant writer himself, I'd say, no, you're too full of, full of hate. You went out to Lisbon to uh, Web, Web Summit, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. 
How was that? How did you, how did you, what made you decide to do it? Because I know you volunteered there, didn't you? What yeah. made you decide to do that? And how did you find it? What advantages well, did you give you? October after 2021, we went to Lisbon, fell in love with the city, saw these big uh, signs, web summit, you know, like big sculptures. And yeah. it, it was obviously on in uh, November. And uh, I looked it up and I thought, oh, it's next week. Uh, and I was a web designer. And I looked at ways of attending, but it's £850 a ticket. Blimey. To go as a delegate. Yeah. And I thought, oh, you know, two days, I can't, I can't justify 1,700 quid for accommodation. Yeah. So I volunteered to get free tickets. So I had to do two days. We spent five days there, me and my son. Uh, I did two days volunteering, working in the media unit. I was the oldest, and I've done a blog about this, I'm the oldest volunteer there. It, it was literally, I walked in this room, and it's full of 20-year-olds, and it was like, here's granddad, me. <laughs> 57-year-old bloke <laughs> from England. But yeah. the, the people, are, again, like Manchester, really friendly. I've made friends with the Matilda uh, from the Algarve, made friends with Emmanuel from Germany. Nice. And I, enjoy, I enjoyed the experience of being at Web Summit and listening to uh, Olga Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky's wife from Ukraine. Oh, really? She was there? Yeah, talking about the internet, how it's been devastated, uh, the infrastructure in the Ukraine. So she did a keynote speech. I enjoyed listening to Airbnb. Uh, and I was just stood at the side with the lanyard on oldest volunteer at Web Summit. <laughs> uh, but yeah. I made... And the intention was to apply for residency, D7 residency, uh, in Portugal, which would mean I could stay longer than three months. And then I'd take my business and become a digital nomad. So, I'd, you know, it doesn't really matter if I'm in Manchester, Norwich or Lisbon. If, as long as you've got a stable internet connection, yeah. clients don't really need to know where you geographically are. Mm. You've been quite vocal, definitely over the years on social media and stuff about your sort of mental health stages after leaving teaching and going into going into your you know your own business, your own setup. I think what intrigues me is whenever I've spoken to anyone or whenever, whenever I felt down or something, doing something on my own is the last thing I want to do. How how did having your own business help you through it? Well, or do you think it did? I guess. Yeah. You well, know. well, you know, again, it's no secret. I became alcoholic. Uh, I developed massive uh, alcohol dependency and I ended up going to the doctors about it and AA. And I stopped six years and two months ago. Uh, six years and a month ago, should I say. So I don't drink anymore, permanently sober. But I think what it did, because I've always had this thing about authority, you know, whether whether it's in teaching or my father and my upbringing, I think what freelance did was made me realise that I've got my own authority. I've got my own ability to control what I do and who I work with. And you haven't in a school, you know, because there's a hierarchy in a school. If you don't go, get on with a colleague or a line manager or a head teacher, you, you're fairly stuck. You either hope that they leave or you've got to leave or you put up with it. And, uh, I, you know, my, my own business has been like, this is my business. You know, you can actually tell people to get off my lawn. Yeah. Where, whereas you can't in teaching. You can't say to a, a, a head teacher, even though you want to, oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you can to a client in a more polite way. You can say, I don't think we're a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and it just it just allowed me to set boundaries, which I've never been able to do uh, yeah. uh, in, in employment because you can't. You, they pay you. You're expected to do it. But now it's the other way around. I decide who I work with. Do you think having that control was was the thing that enabled you to take back control of your mental state and your your own sort of emotions and things, it, it gave you the structure that you wanted to have rather than the structure you were forced into. Yeah, I think I think what it does, I think it's being your own boss. I, I think you can't put a price, and this is what I say to anyone, you know, when my kids are looking for jobs, uh, I say you can't put a price on being your own boss, but you've got to still have that innate motivation. You can't turn around and say, oh, I'm my own boss, and isn't it good running a business? You've got to find the bloody work. It, you, work doesn't come to you mm. without you hustling. If that makes sense, you know, I don't. I don't send out fifty emails a day. I don't send out fifty connection requests with a, a message on a canned message on LinkedIn saying, "Please work with me." But what I did find is that being my own boss took me back to being four when I was laid on a carpet in Doncaster writing these shitty little poems, <laughs> and I could write—I wouldn't say shitty little blogs—I <laughs> could write. I could write blog posts that were that took me back to that creative creative child in me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I really love what I do. So yesterday I wrote a blog post about construction estimating 
And I talked about going into Woolworths and picking up pick and mix and how you go in the cinema and now you weigh it and you think, I've got enough money with 30 quid in my wallet to pay for that pick and mix. Yeah. You know, and so there's a little bit of storytelling in my narratives, in my blog posts, and I love that. Who do you find your target audience are and how do you make sure that you're directing your your um, engagement, to, you're not your engagement, your content towards your target audience? Well, I, I don't, I'm not as strategic as that, Oliver. What, what I tend to do is just be myself. And it's worked throughout my career as a teacher, you know, being myself in front of a class, this authenticity, uh, this respect. And I am now, so I don't really care if someone says, what, you know, I get snarky comments like, why are you taking a photo of the Manchester skyline on LinkedIn? What relevance is it? And I think, well, it's got none, but it, it pleased me. I've got this Marie Kondo thing, where if it gives me joy, yeah. I will share it. Yeah. And if it doesn't give me joy, I'll bin it. I think what it does, as well as certainly someone who's self-employed and has their own business, it gives you an actual whole profile. When I was talking to Cheryl from Disney, actually, she was yeah. telling me that when Disney look at employing someone, they don't want to see you've studied this, you've done this, this is what you can do, you know, because all the applicants have that. They like to see a profile that actually shows what the person is, so their hobbies and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that's what your profile does. Oh, Showing yeah. stuff like the Manchester skyline gives a, a round or two, okay, this is that person that I'm going to be paying to do my work for me, yeah, rather and, than just... And uh, to be honest, I've made myself unemployable by, by my attitude. So I'm not looking for, you know, Disney to say to me, would you like to come on board? Uh, no, I'd like yeah, to be in yeah. the office and start work when I want. I'd like to be able to go to Pizza Express if I want to. I'd like to be able to go up a mountain if I want to, <laughs> yeah. without someone saying, shouldn't you be in work? Yeah. But yeah. what I mean is your cl the people that come across your account, you know, who are referred to or something, oh, yeah, they're good, they're see, they see a whole person rather exactly. than just... Uh, Spot on, yeah. Yeah, they, you know, rather than just someone who's, you know, posting just the work they've done. And what yeah, they've exactly, achieved. and they like it. People do business with people they like, you know. And they're, they're, I had a message the other night on LinkedIn, which really pleased me, uh, from someone, I won't name him, because it's a bit, messages are confidential. But he said, when he first met me on LinkedIn, he, he, he thought I was very black and white, very Marmite character. I was blocking people. But, and there's a bot, I thought, oh God, a bit of a negative message. <laughs> I really like what you post. And I'm really, I'm re I really feel like I know you. And I like that. And he said, I can't give you any work at the moment, but I'm going to recommend you to quite a few. He said, okay. Oh, that's good. Can you send me an introductory email? And that, that thrilled me, you know. So I'm posting a photo going to watch Till, as in Emmett Till, at the cinema. Uh, around the Great Northern in Manchester on Deansgate, I'm posting photos and I get this message as I'm, I'm walking in from someone who's seen it. So you might say, yeah, why is he posting a picture of the Manchester skyline or the Odeon? Why do we need to know that he's going to watch Kill? But inadvertently, it wouldn't be business. Mm. And you, you can't underestimate the power of being holistic, as you said, the whole person. Because it, I think it's been interesting. Yeah. I think if you're a really boring bastard, you know, who's, who's taking a photo of um, a computer and saying, I do web design. <laughs> yeah. And then another angle. You, you're not yeah, going to, yeah. but because, because you, you do things and you're active. Yeah. And I'm happy. I'm, I'm, I've never been as happy as when I've been running my own business. Um, so you said about moving up to, obviously you've moved up to Manchester recently and what the last, just before Christmas, yeah, you moved yeah, up to yeah. Manchester and you've been setting up. How has that been going and, and suddenly being plunged into finding new clients and re-establishing yourself in a different area, I guess? Well, a lot of my friends here, and I think, I think the, that Manchester is naturally friendly, inquisitive, industrious. We, we went in the Britain's Protection last night, didn't we, Oliver? Mm. Oh, and yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a chap in the coat, he's had a bit too much to drink, a chap in a, like a, a sheepskin jacket from, <laughs> in the bar, he's had a bit too much to drink, but he shakes my hand when I walk in as if he knows me, because you said, does he know you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, he likes my coat. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It, 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 I think Manchester is naturally friendly and industrious and creative. So, you know, I, mean, I, I had lunch in a curry house yesterday in Ancoats, and I got three LinkedIn connections from it. And it's not me going around train spotting, you know, thinking, oh, I'll collect a LinkedIn connection. I've got that one bagged. You get people talk here, mm. but there's genuine warmth. So what I found about Manchester is that a lot of the connections that I had on social media, and, and bear in mind, I lived here from 1987 to 1996, so I had nine years here. So I know the area, I know the city, even though it's changed. They've, it's almost been like a homecoming. Yeah. And it, it's felt like, this is this is a place to be for business and home. 
And I, I don't like the weather. I'll <laughs> it's admit cold. that. It's, a it's cold. Colder. It's wet. It's scruffy compared to Norwich City Centre. Very scruffy. You know, there's no way I'd go wild swimming in the canal here. <laughs> you know, it, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd be dead swimming because I'd be dead within one mouthful. Uh, but the people, if, you know, if, if a place is made by people, this this place has got it in pockets. Oh, yeah. yeah. As one thing I have to say, you've never, you haven't lost your northern accent at all. You've had that th- throughout. Notoriously, I don't really have my Norfolk accent anymore, <laughs> <laughs> which I get pointed out to me all the time when I say, oh, yeah, I'm actually from Norfolk. Go, oh, really? Yeah. Or well, they just assume I'm from North Norfolk. Yeah, yeah, yeah you haven't got yeah. attracted by accent. But yeah. I haven't, I, yeah. I definitely did have it at one point. When I go home, I definitely notice I pick it up, but yeah. I, I don't have it anymore. But your Northern accent has never never disappeared, so I'd imagine you, you've sunk in very, very well. Oh, yeah, but pe- people know I'm not from Manchester. Yeah. But it's an inclusive city. Mm. You know, uh, my kids bought me uh, for Christmas, and my daughter bought me black nail varnish because I'm going to Manchester. Uh, to show grieving and because I said it was trendy, I liked uh, people on li- uh, on Instagram who have it. So I put I did one nail, and I felt a bit silly with it. But it's that type of place where you know you can do what you want. Yeah, it's a it's very warm place. Yeah, and it's very in- inclusive as well. Um, yeah, oh, it no feels sen- safe. It feels yeah, safe. Yeah, there's no sense of threat here. And yeah. it, it, part of me thinks you know it's not Lisbon because it's not warm. Mm. It's not Porto, but. It does actually feel like home. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm establishing myself here quite well, and I'd say business is better here than Norfolk. Really? Uh, okay. It's a more prices have had to be uh, adjusted because I don't think money's as uh, generous as in Norfolk. Mm. But then you get more work, so does it really matter? You know, there's a bit of an Aldi mentality here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they want value. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, it, it, but it, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Someone who's maybe thinking about leaving their long-term employment for industry and something and, and thinking about becoming self-employed or setting up their own business, what would be a, a key piece of advice you'd give them? Right, I'd say, you know, if you've seen The Great Escape, the film there, you've got Steve McQueen, I think it is, who's walking around this uh, exercise yard and they're digging a tunnel. So the men inside in this uh, shed are digging a tunnel to get out of this camp, this prison. He's walking around releasing sand and soil from his trouser pockets. You've got to do the same. You don't tell your employer, who's your guard, the prison guard, that you're thinking of going self-employed, but you pick up a shovel and you dig a tunnel secretly. So your first thing is to find a domain name, you know, go on 20i.com, go on company's house, register a name, and think about, like I've said before, think about something you enjoy doing, but what you mustn't do is because most employers are pernicious and most employment places, in my opinion, are toxic, you, you mustn't tell people your plans. So you pick up a spade and you start digging. And it, it's little little uh, nicks in the earth at first. You only damage the surface of the earth. You don't, and your employment is paying for you to do that excavation work. So do not give up your employment Do not tell anyone you've picked up a spade, but start digging. And when that tunnel is ready, and you're ready to escape, you can tell I was an English teacher, (laughs) you then come up the other side of the barbed wire from employment into self-employment. So you're out of that cage, and suddenly this caged bird is singing. You've not got your wings clipped, getting carried away with the metaphors. (laughs) You've not got your wings tied together, and you can soar above all your (laughs) ex-colleagues and say, look, I'm free, I'm free, I'm self-employed. That's so a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, I well, like that. Uh, yeah, that's how I saw it. And uh, I did it. I, I was uh, working in a primary school. I set up Get Pro Copy while I was still in salary mm. uh, because I had the assurance that I was being paid. Uh, and it, it worked. And I've had failed businesses. And don't, don't, don't be scared of failure either. You know, failure is, I failed in the estate agency, but then the failure led to writing work for other estate agents. Yeah. So failure can lead, failure is a good teacher. Yeah, well, oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. everyone says that. That's that's <laughs> good. That's a very good analogy. I like that. And <laughs> yeah, it makes, yeah, it makes me think about the Great Escape. Great film. Perfect. I think that's everything from me. I'll stop there. Thanks very much for for coming on. I appreciate no that, problem, and brother. all the best with Manchester and uh, the future of the business up here as well. Thank you. enjoyed that thanks very much for listening and um please join again soon